I have too many things. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to worship here at Freedom's Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this Sunday morning. A few announcements for us. First, uh, we would like to recognize the beautiful flowers on the altar and loving memory of Missy Shivers from her family. And so, we, of course, we remember Missy so much and miss her greatly. Coming up next Sunday, beginning next Sunday, is our Freedom's Faith Factory, F3 at FC. It is a ministry of our Christian board here, uh, Christian Education Board, and this will be during the Sunday school time uh, for children as they normally go out. They're doing a whole different format, and it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be similar to Vacation Bible School. And so encourage uh, your children and others to come to this and join us as we kick off next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. The Women of Freedoms will be touring on March 9th at the Sebastopol House Historic Site in Seguin. You're going to meet here at the church at 8 a.m. to carpool to that site. And then lunch to follow at the Silver Center. Uh, that is $12, so be prepared for that. And then followed by a trip to the Pole Media Pottery south of Seguin. If you'd like to join us on this trip, please call Marlou Botting at 830-305-4088. The deadline is March 1st. I have put out some resources for you for Lent since we began on Wednesday uh, this last week for Ash Wednesday. You'll see in the back in the narthex on the table uh, resources for Lent. There's some online things and also uh, a really good meditative uh, item I found called 14 Questions of Jesus uh, is something that you might want to go through during the Lenten season. And then on the second page is our schedule for the Lenten and Easter season. As well, uh, I'm a, one that likes to be creative during seasons like this. There is also some coloring pages in the back for children and adults alike. So please take one, and when they run out, I'll make some more for you to have if you would like that. Well, we are here to worship this morning. We're so glad that you could join us. Make sure you, if you're visiting with us or you would like to uh, have us pray for something or more information to complete the information cards that you can find in the pew racks, uh, in front of you and put that in the offering plate uh, during the service or in our offering time. If you're able, please stand as we sing our opening hymn, Ye Servants of God. Oh, I forgot one thing. Let's not sing yet. Sorry. Because I'm going to be in trouble if I forget this. Butter braids. It's butter braids time. And I forgot to make the slide, and so I was almost going to forget to announce it. And I have this really nice poster. If you haven't had butter braids, you talk to me about it. They are good. Uh, they are $16. They're taking orders starting today. And the deadline will be March 26th with delivery date on April 2nd, which is Palm Sunday. And so please, this is a great thing to have for Easter. And so Becky will be there in the narthex taking orders as you leave this morning. Now... Now we can sing together, because I want to hear your angelic voices, ye servants of God, hymn number 11. Jesus. 
now join in our call to worship led by one of our confirmation students, Shiloh Purdom. It's inspired by Psalm 32. As we come to worship God on this first Sunday of Lent, let's begin with words adapted from Psalms 32. Our God will be a hiding place for us. Knowing God forgives our sin, together let us give thanks for the ways we're surrounded by the Holy One. With one voice, let all who are upright in heart shout for joy. For God will instruct and teach us to live out our identities, followers of Christ. Let us share in our song that we've been learning the past few weeks, Where the Spirit of the Lord Is. The Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there is healing. I know the Spirit of the Lord is
the great challenges that we have in the Christian faith at times is truly allowing God's Spirit to be that in our lives. But it's always there, and the hope and promise of God's Holy Spirit is with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. Challenge for us in our world is, is all kinds of other spirits out there, too, in ways, what people will say, what do, their opinions galore out in the world here in this place for a few moments for an hour that we have on sunday we dwell in god's presence that presence my friends gives us great hope and grace and love and certainly peace the peace of christ be with you all let us share and pass the peace of christ with one another peace to you Let's invite the children down front. Sorry for our children's moment. Okay, I have a question for you all. Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong, but you still did it? <laughs> oh, we've got some honest ones up here this morning. I'm loving it. Me too. Me too. One year, years, many, many, many years ago, probably I was your age, just we were visiting my cousins in Tennessee. And they had a swimming pool in their backyard. What? It was awesome. It's not like here where, you know, lots of people have, in hot climates, you have swimming pools, but not in Tennessee. So anyway, they had this large fence around it, and it was still kind of cold, so we weren't allowed to go into the pool. But my cousin said, I know a way in. We climb up on the doghouse, we climb over the fence, and we get in. Okay, so I did it. Climbed over, we stuck our feet in the pool, and my little sister went too, we all went, and then we climbed back out. I know I told my parents that I did that. I remember saying, we're going to go climb over to the pool, and I know they said, that's okay. <laughs> so I find out later that that wasn't what happened, <laughs> because we did it again, and we got caught. And my sister's running around, I can't get out, I can't get out. And I'm trying to climb over the fence, cut my leg a little bit. And boy, were we in trouble. We weren't supposed to climb over that because it's dangerous, right? You have to have adult supervision. There's a reason there's a fence around the pool, I found out. And there is a reason that you make sure your parents are nodding their heads and saying, yes, I hear you and it's okay. Because that's not what they were saying. I said it to them when other people were talking to them. I knew what I was doing. But anyway, I knew it was wrong to do that, right? But I still did it. Well, in our story today, in the scripture passage that Pastor Dave will be talking about later, it talks about Satan, the devil, was tempting Jesus to do some things, to show his power. But Jesus knew that it was the wrong thing to do, and he even quoted back some scriptures to the devil to say, I know you're trying to trick me. I know what it says in there. So for us, believe me, you'll be tempted many, many times. That just means you're, you're going to want, you have this choice. 
am I going to do the right thing or am I going to go the wrong way? I'm going to do the thing I know I'm not supposed to. That's when we rely on God. Help me, God. Help me not get mad at the person that pulled in front of me in the, in the, the line or got in front of me in the line at school. Help me not get mad at somebody because they pushed me. Help me go and tell someone. Don't let me push back. Those are the things that we're so tempted to do because it's only normal, right? When somebody hurts us, we want to hurt back. But we need to ask for help. We need to ask for help from God to help us do the right thing. So, yes, you're going to do the things you know that are not right to do, but God will help you. God will forgive you when you mess up. But let's try to remember, which I'm going to try to do this too, that when I feel like I'm going to do something that's not right, I'm going to say, God, I need your help in this. Help me out, okay? Can y'all do that too? All right, let's say a quick prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for your love and your grace that helps us. Help us to call on you whenever we feel that we might do something we know we're not supposed to do. Help guide us and direct us and forgive us when we mess up. It is in your name I pray. Amen. And I want y'all to remember how much God loves each and every one of you. And so do we. All right. Well, Ms. Vicky's there in the back. Ready? Also, we have nursery for those that are under five years of age. Ms. Lauren's back there, too. Y'all have fun.
was a cute sound. <laughs> Let us spend a few moments in silence as we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning. There are many that we need to remember in prayer, that are in hospital, that are at home, uh, that are seeking treatments or facing treatments, those dealing with loss of loved ones that are grieving. So let us focus our hearts on God here with us, and then I will close this in prayer. Let us pray. God of compassion, God of hope and healing, we come to you. We are reminded during the season of Lent to keep our eyes on the cross, to focus on the sacrifice made and the new life that happens at the end of that journey. But we continue on our journey in life, oh God, aware of things that are difficult for us illness, financial problems, addiction, death, the grief that comes with all of that, the pain. We also give praise for the wonderful days, the wonderful moments of joy, of new life, of children, of opportunities to grow and to learn and to serve. We pray for our world, O oh God. Many are in need of prayer and need to know you are indeed with them every step of the way. We recognize, O oh God, that just the other day it was the anniversary of the war beginning in Ukraine, and we continue to pray for the people there, fortify them, give them strength and peace in the face of war. We pray for many suffering with weather-related issues and earthquakes. And God, we ask for safety and hope. May we seek you on our journey this Lenten season to know that you are indeed our God, that Jesus Christ is with us and the Holy Spirit is our advocate praying for us and with us. And may we often pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is one that speaks of how God is the one that protects us, even when we face evil and difficulty in the world. If you're able, please stand as we sing hymn number 281, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
ask, ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord, serve him his name. From age to age the same. And he must win the battle. You may be seated. Please be seated. All right, let me explain a couple of things first. Years ago, Years ago, like 12, I prayed to God I would be tall one day. I was about 5'11 at 12 years old, pretty tall for 12. I've been 5'11 since then, since 12 years old, until this morning where God provided. God provided about five or six extra inches for me. Only reason is because we're still kind of preaching from here for now. And we've noticed over the last number of weeks, and certainly on Wednesday night, the number of people having to move around their heads to see me when I preach. So I found myself kind of walking side to side so I could see eyeball to eyeball to everybody. I thought, that's more steps that I want to put in on a sermon. So I want to stand right here. We'll see how this goes today, all right? It's great being this tall, by the way. I love this. All right. Gospel reading today, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Jesus has just been baptized by John in the Jordan River. The Spirit descends upon him, and the voice from heaven, This is my Son, whom I well pleased. The very next story is this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. 
But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not even dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. This says the scripture passage that we read often, in fact every time, on the first Sunday of Lent, which is today, and we remember the 40 days of Lent by remembering the 40 days that Jesus was tempted there, excuse me, Jesus fasted and prayed in the wilderness, then tempted by the devil, as we now prepare our hearts and minds as for the Easter season that's upon us as well. So we'll remember this today and the story, but first we will travel there for a few moments to the place itself. Jesus, you'll remember that there was a miraculous event. A dove descended from heaven and the voice of God identified Jesus as his son. Pretty amazing stuff. So what happened after that? Did the crowds hoist Jesus onto their shoulders like he had just scored the winning basket at the final buzzer? Not hardly. Instead of big fanfare, Jesus, oddly enough, traveled out here into the rugged Judean wilderness for 40 days of seclusion. After 40 days in the wilderness without food, the Gospels record a fascinating one-on-one -on -one encounter between Jesus and the fallen angel, Satan. Here is the Gospel of Matthew's description of what happened. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. These temptations basically followed three patterns. The first temptation concerned the lust of the flesh. Jesus was hungry, and Satan tempted him to convert stones into bread. The second temptation concerned the pride of life. Satan challenged Jesus to throw himself off of the high place of the temple, knowing that God would send angels to catch him. The third temptation concerned the lust of the eyes. Satan showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the earth and their splendor saying, I will give all of this to you if you will simply bow down and worship me. Now, 
if you noticed, Jesus used the same three words in response to each temptation. It is written. Jesus responded by quoting the Hebrew scriptures, which he had been studying since he was a boy. Now, after his time of testing out here in the Judean wilderness, he returned to the region of Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He returned to his hometown of Nazareth and began teaching. Luke records that Jesus went out in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout the whole country, and he was teaching in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So that's the place, and Jesus has been baptized. And, and just to the west of the Jordan River, begins what is the Judean wilderness, and it's a lot of mountains and rocks, rocks and dirt and dust. If you've been to some of those places, if you've been to West Texas or Big Bend or places in New Mexico, Southern Colorado, Arizona, you know what I'm talking about. I love going out to the Big Bend area, by the way. I think it's a perfect place. Me and people I love and nature. And there's a few people that go with me each time, the people I love that go out there. I've been once, by the way, but it's like the wilderness journey that's out there. I love it out there, but this is where it is. Now, what we don't know for sure is the exact location Jesus went out in this wilderness. It's just, just on a mountain range that begins just west of the River Jordan Valley. The valley itself is very fertile, lots of water, lots of things grow there. It's a place where people live. It's also where the town, the city of Jericho is. And we believe that Jesus probably now walked, he probably still wet from the baptism, walks there, goes through Jericho, then up to the mountain and across that mountain into this vast wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights where it is, he is fasting. And the idea of fasting, that he is praying and fasting 40 days, 40 nights. Now, I don't want to get all into this notion of scientifically that, okay, how did he survive 40 days, no food, no water? The point of this is that it is a spiritual exercise showing us what this is about. The 40 days commemorates first and foremost the 40 years of Moses and the Hebrew people in that wilderness before they get to the Holy Land. Also later on, Moses spends 40 days on the mountain with God, listening for God's and God's instruction. And even after that, Elijah spends 40 days in seclusion, praying to God, asking for God's help. So it is little wonder that we find now Jesus out in this wilderness. We just don't talk about this a whole lot. Then after the 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible says he's famished. He's probably hungry, tired, he's thirsty, tired of praying, tired of being there. And that's when the devil shows up. We'll talk about that in just a moment. We think that where this happens was just, just, to, just to the west of Jericho, where there was plenty of water, plenty of food, plenty of everything. In fact, you can go to Jericho today. We got a couple of pictures there I want to show you. I've been to Jericho, and the first, you can't quite take, see it well enough on the left side. That is a monastery built into the side of the mountain where it is believed that Jesus would have been. And the, on the other side are these wonderful, from the Greek Orthodox Church, in that monastery, beautiful figures in a place of worship right there in that monastery. The next picture that you will see up there is some that I took that's from that monastery on the side of that mountain. You actually can go outside, and there's a walkway right outside with rooms on the side of this, and I'm thinking, boy, I hope there's not an earthquake today that I'm here because that kind of scares me a little bit. And then the next picture that we'll see is right there in Jericho, that one, where it says it's called, it's called the oldest city in the world, and as you know, the stories of Jericho are prominent in the Old Testament. That's where Joshua, remember, he did something at Jericho. You remember the old song? What did Joshua do at Jericho? He fought the battle of Jericho. And what did the walls do? Did they get higher? No, the walls came tumbling down. Put that on next week's song list. We're going to sing that here. Joshua fought the battle. And right outside where you can go up to this monastery and even further into the Judean wilderness 
is a wonderful restaurant of all things. It's called the Temptation Restaurant. We ate there. We took the little tram up to the monastery, walked around. It was, hot. It was January. It was still hot and dry and dusty. We came back down. First place we went to was the Temptation Restaurant. Isn't that amazing? So all the while, all the while when Jesus is in the wilderness, he's literally not that far from civilization the whole time. But he doesn't go there. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's amazing how the story goes. The spirit that came upon Jesus at baptism like a dove and said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. It's the same spirit that sent him into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by the devil. God's plan that day was just this. So our thought today is not just how Jesus survived all this and what Jesus did and the places that God takes us. Today, we explore it from a different angle, the places the devil takes us. Have you ever thought about that? Well, you probably have at times in, in your own life. The places the devil will take us. It's a marvelous scene. You see, what we have here is the presence of evil, and the presence of evil was not, was not made flesh and lived among us as Jesus was. The presence of the devil is it's in the spiritual realm, if you will. And only a few times do we have the devil even speaking to people, mostly in the book of Job. But then this is the, one of the longest discourses that we have with the devil, and it's with Jesus. And when does the devil show up? On day one of the fasting and prayer? Or week two? No. When does the devil show up? After the 40 days, when Jesus in his human form is most vulnerable to everything out there into the world. Have you ever been so hungry in life you would eat just about anything? Anything. I've been there. Have you ever been thirsty enough like I am right now? Well, you drink of just about anything, including health, multi-use vapor, distilled water. No, that's not, right. that's not what's in there, but it's... It's what's on the label in there. Ever been so tired that you're just looking for anything? Have you ever been so just exhausted, grumpy, upset, mad, whatever it is? Have you noticed in places in your life where you have perceived that you're most vulnerable to the bad things, the temptations in life? When you're hurt, when you're afraid, all those things. And that's the exact place that Jesus was on this day. And the devil shows up. And the devil takes Jesus to several places. The first place is to Jesus' own physical nature as a human being. He says, I know, Jesus, that you're tired, you're hungry, you've been out here for 40, 40 days. I've been kind of watching you from a distance, so to speak. So if you're that hungry, if you're not hungry now, you have the power. You, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, you have the power to even turn the stones around you into bread so you don't go hungry. And Jesus does not fall into that trap of the temptation. Sure, he could have, because later on he does some marvelous signs and wonders. He turns water into wine. He provides, multiplies the food for the many there, the 5,000 or more. Different times he does different things, but for a purpose, but not for this. Not for Satan's benefit. It's before the glory of God. One does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. You and I, we don't know a whole lot about going hungry. As I've said this to several of you, and Sonia and I, we've been here eight years, and we say to folks halfway jokingly, there's one thing we haven't done in our eight years of being in Texas. Do you know what that is? We haven't gone hungry. Not day one. We have plenty of food all the time. Everywhere we show up, there's some food. We have food. We don't know what it is to, to be that hungry at times in our life. But Jesus says even if our, we are physically hungry, we have to curb our appetites, understand that what we have to eat and need to eat, but we are fed spiritually by the word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus is taking this experience and turning to a spiritual one. Not just a physical one, not just an emotional one, not just mental, but spiritual. That's the place in our lives where we have to understand the devil can show up and take us down a road where we don't need to be. We have a hard time 
in our life, fulfilling our appetites, not just physical ones, mental, emotional, and we'll turn to any source to do that. We love the release of those chemicals in our brains that make us feel better. And we'll turn to so many different things to do that. Different kinds of food, different kinds of drink, different kinds of relationships in life to fulfill some hunger, some deep hunger in our lives that we receive, we have. And Jesus is saying that the way of God is how we fulfill that. And all these other things will be added unto you. So now the devil is not, not uh, satisfied with any of that. So now they're going on a road trip from the Judean wilderness. And he took him to the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and says to him, jump off, jump off. For it is written in the scriptures that God will command God's angels concerning you and they will just come in and swoop up and rescue you. Now I want you to get this, this image in your mind how this is a spiritual exercise because I don't want us to get caught up and say, well, was he really on top of the, of the temple that day with the devil and where were the other people in the temple and on the streets of Jerusalem? Wouldn't somebody be looking up saying, hey, what's going on up there? Who are these guys? And oh, by the way, how they get up there? There's no way to even get up there at all. No, don't get caught up in that. Be caught up in the spiritual exercise of what this means. You see, Satan was saying, look, Look, son of God, you have the power to do amazing things and wonders and signs. Wouldn't it be amazing, Jesus, if any time you just simply went to the temple, you got to the top of it, you could fly up with the angels if you want and simply just jump off. Boy, wouldn't that attract a crowd. Oh, my goodness. What would it be if that weighs today? 10,000 people have it live streaming on their phones and their, and their devices. Look at this guy. He's jumped off the, the temple. Oh, what was that? Were those UFOs that came in and saved him all of a sudden? No, a balloon? No, they're angels. What a great event. What a spectacle that would be. And Jesus says to him, no, no, do not put your Lord God to the test. Why in the world? Do so many of our places of worship, and for the sake of our discussion today, this is called the temple of the church. Why do we think we need to do such great stunts and events to get people's attention to show our power? Why do we resort to that? I don't know. I've heard more in the last three weeks about a certain church in the area than I've heard in the previous eight years combined. I so get tired of hearing about other places. That's not where the devil is going to allow me to go. I'm not going there. I know what other churches do. I know what kind of big events they may have. I know the money they put into things. I get all that. I just don't personally, I just don't get into things that would be, you know, like that, that style. I don't get into what I think could be distractions. I don't get into things that I think are just gimmicks and stuff like that. I'll tell you a quick story. There's a, a certain church. See if this rings any bells. A certain church that has a big, strong, thriving Wednesday night program geared to their teenagers. And kids from all over will go to that event on a Wednesday night. And some of the other ministers in town are kind of wondering, well, what's going on? there and then we hear about it and the minister saying wow that's that's stuff we just can't we can't do or provide we're not sure if we even even want to and we and we hear about what they do and they have bands and special guests and do all these games and giveaway and free food and t-shirts and the whole shebang and that the kids will go there and parents will just drop their kids off there on wednesday and let them there for a couple of hours an hour or more and we came to talk of the town That church was not here. That church is in Louisville, Kentucky, and the year is 1992. This is nothing new about this stuff. That church in Louisville that drew all these kids, every Wednesday night they gave away a Nintendo system. Who knows what Nintendo is, by the way? We're talking 1992. Every Wednesday night gave away a Nintendo's 
play system to the teenager that brought the most new friends with them every Wednesday night. It became such a, a big thing. And later on, I had a conversation with one of the moms who said our kid just likes going there on Wednesdays because he doesn't like kind of what we do here, kind of traditional and just not exciting. They have all the bells and whistles and stuff like that. And I said to her, what happens when these people age out of that? She goes, what do you mean? Well, your child's going to graduate in two years, so are they coming back? Well, two years went by, and no. In fact, they stopped going by the time they were seniors because it didn't mean anything to them anymore. And later on, they came back to that, our church, saying, you know what, we're here, here again. And I said, well, bless your hearts. You know, and, and, and I think about that because it's, at times it's hard for us to compete, if you will, with things like that. Where I become vulnerable in those conversations is this. Sometimes it's not in the spirit of the Lord, of the Lord speaking to me, my response. Sometimes it's just where the devil has taken me in my own sense of insecurity, inadequacy, not being popular enough, young enough, hip enough to do things like that. I understand it. I, I was told recently, well, you know, this place, they've got all their kids and their ministers. They're on all the social media and stuff. And I'm not, I'm on some social media, but not a lot. And they said, yes, even like TikTok, they do these TikTok things. I've read about TikTok a lot in my life. I've never been on it. So I decided to go look on it this week. I wish I'd get that 30 minutes of my time back in my life, but I won't now. I don't know if you're on TikTok, but that's apparently what kids like to do. And you know, these short form videos that they just do for anything, anything. Uh, and, and I don't know if I want to do that. And not to belabor this point too much, but one of those, you can go, you go live on TikTok. Just get on the app, go live like you do on Facebook. There was one person that did live. This is, I'm not kidding. They were live. And they were in a Cracker Barrel restaurant, and the live stream was them ordering from the menu. Live. Cracker Barrel restaurant ordering from the menu. And people would remark, and you could see the things on there. I'm thinking, you know, well, good for her and the family, and I hope they leave a tip, you know, that kind of thing. Now, I don't want to get down a, a road too much. I wanted to say to, to someone about that, about TikTok, you realize TikTok is owned by the Chinese, right? Owned by the Chinese. And they have headquarters, guess where? Cayman Islands. That's where they're listed as their corporate office, Cayman Islands. Any idea why a Chinese company would be listed in the Cayman Islands? Because they like the fishing and the scuba diving? No. Sometime, go look up why corporations list themselves in the Cayman Islands, including some Texas ones, by the way, and what that means. I'm not going to do that today. So I'm thinking, wow, we got so upset as a country that COVID invaded our shores from China, yet we don't lift a finger about this information gathering system from TikTok that's in helping and emboldening the Chinese government. All right, that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> Do you get my point? <laughs> Unbelievable. Do not put your Lord God to the test. Why can't churches, places of worship, people of faith, be okay with simply gathering in the presence of God? That was good enough for Jesus. Why ain't it good enough for the rest of us? We got Baptists in the crowd today. I'm, I'm, I'm loving that. <laughs> All right. Devil's not finished. When is the devil ever finished? Never. Keep that in mind. The devil will take you places you don't want to go, but boy, do we go there. Again, the devil, now the devil's gone with him now in the wilderness, wants to turn rocks into bread. I'm thinking, you know, I don't want really bread. If we're going to do this with rocks, let's do some cheesecake maybe. But it was bread and not that. Now the, the game has been upped a little bit more. Let's go to the temple. Ooh, the temple was a place. That didn't work either. Now the game is really get, raising up. The stakes are higher. The devil took him to a very high mountain. And showed him all the other kingdoms of the world and their glory. The kingdoms with territory and food and water and gold and palaces and armies. All those things that would be kind of cool to have. 
And the devil says, all these things I will give you. If you fall down and worship me. That's all you got to do. My goodness, the promises made by people of what you're going to get if you simply go their way. Listen to this. Go their way. The promises to you. How many of you have signed up for something because you thought there was going to be a promise that you were going to get after you signed up? Have you ever done that? Oh, yes, you have. Oh, yes, you have, because the, much of the marketing world has got your name and email or phone number in that because of something that you're supposed to get. Didn't read the fine print in there. You know, that's why, you know, uh, sir, do you have an email address we can use for this purchase? I said, no. You know, I'm giving some of your email addresses to them right from my phone. Here, use this one. Use this one, and you can do that. No, I don't really do that, but I think about it all the time. Fall down and worship me. It's more than simply devil worship, which was another one of the TikTok videos. Some guy dressed up some kind of demon as it, in some kind of little dark temple and with minions supposed to be worshiping him. I'm thinking, you know, you people are the silliest. Are there some, is there some kind of TikTok award show for best v video of the year later on? It's just a terrible thing. And Jesus says to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Worship the Lord your God only. Now, before, before we have this idea that, yes, it's easy, it's easy to walk away, ignore, not do what we might have a version of Satan or the devil, is that person in a red suit with red horns and a red tail spewing evil things. Keep this in mind. And Sonia spoke about this recently on the transfiguration with those three 40-day guys again, Moses, Elijah, and, and Jesus, and with three disciples. And the apostle Peter, St. Peter as we know, said to him, hey, let's don't go down the mountain. Let's stay here. This is great. This is where I want to be. And what does Jesus say to our St. Peter? Get behind me what? Satan. If Peter can be a Satan at times, oh my goodness, so can me, or so can I. There's grammar in there somewhere. I can too. We have to think about that, my friends. Okay, he says to him, worship the Lord your God only. At that point, the devil left him, and suddenly angels. How many other times do we have suddenly angels? When was the last time? Suddenly angels. And maybe the devil's thinking, you know, the last time, Jesus, where there were suddenly angels, you weren't even old enough to know what happened. Suddenly angels at your birth. But then suddenly angels came and waited on him. And that is to say in the scriptures, that is, they then provided the food and the water and the comfort, all that he needed. It was indeed provided for him. Jesus would say that to all the listeners who would listen after all that. The kingdom of God is your first first thing in life, and everything else will be added upon you. Don't worry about what you eat, or what you will drink, or what you will wear, and those things you do. Be faithful to God in everything that you will need in life. God will provide for you, and sometimes, in fact, very often, we are the ones doing the providing. Why do we do that? Because we're acting out the way Jesus did. That's what Christians are supposed to do. We do that. When someone is in need, we provide. Oh, we get caught up into stuff. We get caught up in so much of things and the frou-frou, distractions of what it is to be Christian, especially in this society, because we're distracted all the time. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I know what it is to try to, to entertain people uh, and try to get their attention and get them committed. I, I get all that. Our world is filled with that on a daily basis a daily basis. We are marketing geniuses in our world today. We know what to do. Drawing a crowd is always not that difficult to do, my friends, but are you drawing crowds for the right reasons, the right purposes? You see, when, when the devil said, hey, I want you to jump off the roof of the worship place, the high holy church temple, that's going to be an amazing thing, and everybody now has to acknowledge that you, who you are, 
and because of the big sign and miracle that's there. And Jesus later on says to people, don't tell anybody yet about the miracles because I need them to believe in me as son of God and real Messiah and not just some great magician or great entertainer. You know, I suppose, I suppose that on any given Sunday, I or maybe Sonia could get on top of its roof here, the ceiling here, not me, I can't do that stuff anymore, and say, hey, I'm going to jump off today. And then, and then for a week, we could put out on our own versions of Facebook and, and YouTube and TikTok and whatever it is, by signs, we can get billboards, call the radio station, call TV, call everybody, that on this day, that on a certain day, Pastor Dave is going to leap off, leap off the steeple, that lighted steeple, and land and come and see what happens. Now, while you're here, we need you to buy some things while you're here. We're going to have some, some booths set up. There'll be T-shirts and some water you can buy and things like that. And oh, by the way, an offering, an offering. Uh, we, boy, wouldn't that be a great way to sell butter braids, you know, that day out there. And then at the last minute, the last minute, it's okay, Dave, when are you jumping? I'm thinking, you know, I'm having really second thoughts about the whole thing at this point because I'm not quite sure this is what I really want to do. But you said you could do this. Yeah, I know, but, you know, is there a net? Please have a net somewhere around there. But I don't do that. We don't do those things. Why? Why try to put God to the test? Just be faithful, authentic. The greatest thing we have in the world is not gimmicks. It's God's love. Why don't we try that first and foremost? It came later on, you know, trying to reach young people. I know, these three, four, thank you, came in, Ryland, and there's a fifth one somewhere, right? We have five, all right? They can attest. They've been with Sonia and me since last September in confirmation class almost every Sunday, right? You can say yes, yes, say right. <laughs> Is it always the most entertaining hour and a half of your life? You can say no, why? Because... <laughs> You can say no because that's the truth, right? It's not the most entertaining hour and a half, right? But as we said last week, and it took me an hour and a half to say it, we're not, I can't entertain you because I want you to learn something while you're there. If all the bells and whistles and lights and bands and fog machines were so great, why don't you have that at your house to entertain your young people? Or why don't they do that in math class at the school? If that is so great and wonderful, they don't do it there. Why? Why don't they do it there? Give me an answer. I guess because the teachers have some other things they want to do other than entertain the kids. At some point in time, church has to be more about entertainment. You've got to know something and grow while you're here. That's why we're called to do this. Jesus will encounter a young person later after all this. He was rich, a young person with money. There are so many young people around here with money, it's amazing. Some of these young people, teenagers, have a lot more money than I do in their lives, and I'm thinking, where do they get all this money that they use? And so Jesus encounters this young man with money, and, and the man's been seeing Jesus for a while and thinking, wow, this is really neat what he is saying. He's like no other teacher I, I have heard, and his followers are very, very different. Who is this person? And he says, you know, so, so what can I do to be saved? What can I do to be saved to get this eternal life and eternal presence with God that you've been talking about? And Jesus gave him the first part of the answer. He says, well, you, you do what's been taught to you over your lifetime. You obey the laws of Moses, like what they teach in the temple and synagogues, and you hear and obey the words of all those prophets about what to do and not to do, how to help the poor, how to treat people. All that stuff's there. And he said, well, I... I think I kind of do that already. And Jesus, this is what I love and where we have to be. Jesus doesn't just gloss over that. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. He already knew what was keeping this person separated from what he really needed to be. He says, one thing you must do now. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then come follow me. And that just stunned and floored this young person. Because the young person had a lot of money, had a lot of possessions. And it's not just he had those, the money possessions, the money possessions had him, a grip on him. And it's like he couldn't let it go. No, I, I, I like my stuff. 
I like my stuff. I like all my stuff. I like my bells and whistles and, 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 my, and my truck and all these other things. If he had a truck, maybe even a car, I don't know, all this stuff, all this stuff. And he walks away. The young person walks away. And then what happens next is so remarkable. Jesus doesn't go chasing after him. He lets him walk away. He's already, he can't do the one thing. There are some churches in the world today, and I don't want to cast too many stones because I'm guilty of a lot of things. I'll get to that in just one moment. A lot of places I want to say, go into that meeting and a big meeting you're having today with all this stuff there and say, hey, you know what? Jesus says in order to be saved, you have to go and sell all your possessions to the poor and see what kind of response you get. Usually not very welcoming. But there's more to that story. It's not about the possessions. It's about what keeps you from truly following God in your life. It's not all the distractions. Now, lastly, I know you like that word most of all today, lastly. I know that at Freedom's Church, we can't do everything. A lot of things we want to do as a church. A lot of things that we want to do even before COVID. We've done surveys, if you remember all that before. We're going to do some new ones. And who we are, I think, I think the best gift that we can do in guidance with the Holy Spirit, one is resist those moments of temptation when we're vulnerable about what we think others want us to be in life. But let's be sure that we are very much sure and confident what God wants us to be as a church in life. And two things we can do moving forward. One is establish, reestablish our identity who we are, what we want to be, what that means, and then determine what our values are in that identity. Other churches can do that. Even the ones that I don't like very much, what they've done is that they've determined their identity, they know what they value, and they've worked now, they've created a plan that carries that out, and what they do now is simply work that plan, and they will invest every resource, every ounce of energy and volunteers, and, and time and money into, into that. Into that. That's what we need to do. Now, don't walk out of here today thinking, oh my goodness, we're not doing anything. No, our church does a lot of stuff. It's just not always out there. It doesn't have the glamour effect. It's not TikTok worthy, I guess, because no one here is doing it with your phones or pads right now, which is fine with me. You know, we're, oh, by the way, folks, we're all live streaming on Facebook. Forget about that part. Hello, out there. But this, we need a a reminder. Our church has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into a ministry. You just don't know it all the time. That hundreds of thousands of dollars did not go into new buildings. It did not go into a teenager program or a grade school program or into young adults, mid adults, senior adults. All that money went into pre-K kids right over there. Do you know how much money you spent? $600,000. And you borrowed most of that, and we had to pay it back in 2015, if you remember that. It just doesn't get all the buzz. It's a ministry to pre-K kids, and some of the teachers, sometimes their parents. And we're not over there with our, with our phones and, and doing great things with that to put it online in media. You know, but that's it. You've done those things. So the point of this today is what Jesus says in the model prayer. Lead us not into what? Temptation, but deliver us from that evil one, that devil, that Satan, so we can be faithful in our journey together as people of God. Amen and amen. Oh, holy God, give us minds to understand, hearts to know, ears to listen, and a spirit that we can live out your promises to us. Help us to know these stories of Jesus, that we can have them on our heart, and that we can teach them to others, especially our children, this day and for all of our days to come. Amen. Thank you for spending a few extra moments with me. Now we'll stand and have our closing hymn together. We're going to sing together our hymn, hymn number 271, Oh Jesus, I Have Promised. We're going to do two verses of this beautiful hymn.
Friends, on this day, please, if you would like to help out our Christian Ed team with things like Vacation Bible School, uh, Butter Braids is a fundraiser for that event, and there's a table set up out there. On this day, my friends, my goal every Sunday is this, is that the word of the Lord speak to you, not just me, but the Spirit of God that is trustworthy and true in our lives. We face so many challenges in, in our world today. And I know sometimes I get on my soapbox. That's why I brought the big box here today. <laughs> I'm hoping now that to, to uh, tone down some of the conversations people think I need to have with them. My word is this. I usually know more about what you're trying to tell me than you know yourself. I'm just saying that out there. Is this, if that sounds arrogant, well, then it's arrogant. That's where the devil took me there for just a moment, but I'll come back to you shortly. So our closing prayer today is this, my friend, and it's something that we say together, correct? Yes. yes. So say this with me as we leave today, our closing prayer. Oh God, on our journey through Lent, teach us to pray with faith and read your word with understanding. Teach us to worship with passion and gather together with love and teach us generously serve compassionately and use our time mindfully so that we may reflect your goodness and others may discover your grace through us. Amen. All right. Open up every door, right on every wall, 
Sing it in every room. 